JPEG images, one of the great staples of basically all of computing life. It is probably one of the most prevalent things. I mean, you get it on the internet, you get it out of cameras, it's really everywhere. And surprisingly for a piece of technology that is so widespread, JPEG actually is an extremely complex encoding scheme. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a look behind the scenes at how JPEG does its job. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to understand and appreciate the way it works even more. Anyway, you're watching a Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this video in the same order as JPEG actually goes through. Essentially JPEG splits this into a number of parts and each part has a certain role. By performing these processes in that particular order, that is how JPEG actually achieves that huge amount of compression on images. But before we do that, let us begin with some definitions. JPEG, which we normally see spelled as JPG, is actually a contraction of a contraction, which in fact is JPEG, and that stands for the Joint Photographic Experts Group. The whole reason behind why JPEG works so well is because it performs what is known as lossy compression. And basically what that means is an encoder goes through your original image and says, hey, you probably can't see this detail, let's throw that away. The whole point of doing this of course is to basically allow you to represent the image in a lower number of bytes. And well, that essentially is lossy compression in a nutshell. Here's the compression in action. What I have here is a raw image captured by a DSLR. I've converted the image to both a bitmap and JPEG file format. Notice the huge difference in file size. Just for a bit of background, the bitmap file simply saves the colors of all the pixels one after another. This means there is no compression at all. In terms of quality, when zoomed out enough to view the entire image, the two images look identical. However, if we were to zoom right in, Notice how the nature of the noise looks different as we toggle between the JPEG and bitmap versions of the image. This in fact is the only evidence we have of the lossy JPEG compression at work. So now that we kinda know, you know, the whole idea of what JPEG is trying to do, let's actually take a look at how it is actually done. The first step in JPEG compression is what is known as chroma subsampling. So right off the bat, that doesn't sound very simple, but really conceptually, it's not that complicated. Chroma subsampling basically exploits the fact that while we can see differences in brightness very easily, we are not that good at seeing differences in color. JPEG can basically throw away some color information. In fact, it throws away a lot of color information because it knows you cannot see the difference. So this is a very summarized version of how this works. But essentially the image, which originally is a bunch of pixels in RGB, that is red, green and blue, is actually converted to a different color representation called Y'CBCR. You see, RGB is a way of representing the colors on the image by talking about the brightness of the individual red, green and blue channels. While this is useful for many purposes, for this particular case, we prefer to have brightness and color information separate. And that's exactly what Y'CBCR actually does. When represented this way, we now have brightness information in one channel, and that is the Y' prime channel. And then CB and CR basically work together to tell you what is the color of each individual pixel. The way in which CB and CR actually works can be very easily explained by taking a look at this graph from Wikipedia. In this graph, Y is set to 0.5. The horizontal axis represents CB, and the vertical axis represents CR. So for example, in this particular graph, if you want this purplish color, that would be about 0.5 in the CB scale, and also 0.5 in the CR scale. That, in a nutshell, is how, you know, this particular color representation actually works. Now, what JPEG compression does is it actually takes the CB and the CR channel, and it lowers the resolution on these channels. What this means is, well, color information is being discarded. 
And since the brightness information is not being compromised in this manner, well, the image still looks alright. So that was the first of three steps used by JPEG compression to actually, well, throw away some data in a way that you cannot really see. The second method also does something along these lines. You see, the human eye has a more difficult time seeing changes in detail that are all close together. So what that means is, we can discard such detail without suffering from an apparent loss of quality. This is where things get a little bit more complicated. In order to find such details, we have to represent an image in terms of its frequencies. For you to understand this better, let us first take a look at frequency in a context of sound. Let's say we have a wave that looks like this. This is called a sine wave, and is interesting to us because it repeats at a fixed interval. Because of that, we can actually derive its frequency, which is defined as the number of occurrences of the repeating segment per unit time. Not all sounds are as simple as a sine wave, but we can create more complex sounds by mixing multiple sine waves together. For example, the wave you see here is a combination of 697 Hz and 1209 Hz sine waves, and is in fact the sound you hear when you press the 1 button on a telephone keypad. What does this have to do with images? Well, as it turns out, we can express the contents of an image in a very similar manner. Instead of dealing with the amplitude of sound, we are now dealing with the intensities of pixels on an image. To visualize this better, let's take a look at a simple program I've written in Java. These two panels represent an 8x8 pixel segment of a JPEG image. The panel on the right shows a segment as it will appear in the final image, while the panel on the left is a representation of the frequencies in the image. The horizontal axis on this panel refers to increasing amounts of horizontal frequency in the final image. The more we move towards the right, the more vertical bands there are. Conversely, as we move down in the frequency representation, we begin to add more horizontal bands, which indicates an increase in frequency vertically. We can add or subtract a particular frequency, and as you can see, tweaking the values this way causes the final image to change accordingly. The upper left corner represents a frequency of zero both horizontally and vertically, so tweaking it changes the intensity of the whole image. Any other spot in the panel refers to a combination of a particular horizontal and vertical frequency. In JPEG encoding, however, we are moving in the opposite direction. The challenge here is that given a complex final image, we want to break it down into individual frequencies. This is done by a process called Discrete Cosine Transform, or DCT for short. So why do we go to all this trouble? Recall what I mentioned earlier about how our eyes aren't too great at detecting changes in detail that is close together? As it turns out, that corresponds to the highest frequencies. DCT is the method used for us to separate these high frequency elements from the rest of the image. Now, DCT in and of itself doesn't actually compress anything, it just helps you identify what to throw away. So we still need to think about the process of throwing things away. This step is called quantization, and the idea is to basically represent a varying level using a limited number of bits. Let's say now, we want to represent the brightness of a pixel. It is up to us to decide how many levels of brightness we want to use to represent that particular pixel. For example, if I wanted to represent each pixel with 256 levels, then I would need 8 bits to describe every pixel. Conversely, if I was okay with having just 64 levels per pixel, then I would only need 6 bits. Of course, the less bits we use, the less space we require on disk. But this comes with a drawback. Compare a representation that uses 16 levels to a representation that uses just 4. There is no way to represent this particular color with the latter. We can only settle for an approximation. In fact, I could grab the bar in the center of the screen and actually quantize it according to the levels we've set. Notice how much rougher the gradient looks when we quantize it down to 4 levels. It appears far more smooth when we actually use 16 levels of quantization instead. Basically, when JPEG tries to compress an image, they allot less bits to the high frequency components. Since you can't really tell anyway, you don't have to use so many bits to represent that information. Whereas for the lower frequency stuff, 
more bits are used because, well, the changes are more apparent. One point to note before we wrap up on DCT, earlier on I did mention that DCT basically works on just little chunks of image, and that is basically what JPEG does. In fact, when JPEG compresses your image, it chops up your image into little chunks of 8x8 pixels. And each one of these little blocks are actually represented by their own DCT grid. This also explains why when you're looking at a highly compressed image, you might actually see just these little squares. In fact, this is an artifact called macro blocking and is a result of the image being split into little 8x8 chunks for DCT processing. Incidentally, speaking of heavy compression, this is the one step that you actually have control over. When you save a JPEG image, you're normally asked what quality you want the image to be in. Your setting at this point basically determines how aggressive the quantization actually is. So alright, we're nearly done. All we need to do now is to grab the image data that we have and write it to disk as a series of bits. Sure, we could just take the data we have and write it, but that would not be efficient. The last step of JPEG compression basically does something similar to how you would compress a text file. It uses a method called Huffman coding, and this is basically how it works in a nutshell. So to illustrate how Huffman coding works, we're actually going to just put aside the idea of encoding an image, and let us just think about encoding a text file. So here's a text file of ASCII characters. If we were to actually save it as, you know, a plain text file, then every character is 8 bits. Now that seems rather wasteful. I mean, some characters basically occur extremely often, some characters extremely rarely, and yet they're all represented with the same amount of bits. This is the problem that Huffman coding tries to tackle. Basically what it does is it looks through all the text and decides which letters actually appear the most often. The letters that appear the most often are allotted to the least number of bits. Characters that are more rare are allotted slightly more bits, seeing as that, well, they don't occur very often, we need a way to tell them apart from the rest of the letters, so well, we'll give it a few more bits. The penalty wouldn't be so great, seeing as that they don't occur often. Huffman coding is very interesting, because what it does is it takes a look at the incoming information first and it basically generates on the fly an encoding scheme that works best for this input that has just come in. And that's great, because what this means is the compression is tailored to the inputs. You're never going to get some input that will basically break this and create a huge file. Going back to JPEG, basically Huffman coding does its job. It looks through the information it has to encode, decides which elements are basically occurring extremely often, and allots less bits to these. Whereas pieces of input data that occur very rarely are allotted to more bits. By using this method to represent and write the file to disk, well, you save on space again. And that is the final step. You take the information, you run it through Huffman coding, and you write it to disk. What you have on disk now is a file that is compressed in many ways. When you open a JPEG file, all these steps are reversed. Well, not all of them, seeing as that some of the steps actually throw away some information. But basically what happens is you take the data, you reverse the Huffman coding on it to get all your DCT information back. This DCT information basically represents the frequency information of the image. By reversing the DCT process, we get back the channels of the original image in Y prime CBCR format. Once we convert this back to RGB, we're good to go the image can now be displayed normally. The reconstructed image is then displayed. And well, basically, that is how JPEG works. So this video has run a little long, but hopefully this has given you some insight into how JPEG works. Many of these steps are very interesting, especially because they actually exploit on the fact that we can't see certain types of detail very well. So yeah, that's JPEG, an image format that we use all the time, but it's actually surprisingly complex. Anyway, that's all there is for this particular video. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Hello! If you enjoyed this video, don't forget I appreciate every like, favorite, and comment you give me. If you'd like to see more from me in the future, don't forget to subscribe. For more updates outside of YouTube, 
do follow my official Twitter account at 0612TV. And if you'd like to see more of my work, you can also check out my About Me page. Once again, thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612TV.